Yes. Lord, as we come into your presence with thanksgiving and praise, Lord, and Lord, we just pray, move in our hearts and spirits. Take us to a new level in you. Lord, we just want more of you, Lord. And I pray that each person will be touched today in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Well, I have to confess, I went to uh, my 50th class reunion last night. I was around a bunch of old people. (laughs) It was amazing how we all got old. (laughs) And uh, some look more old than others. Uh, But it was was a good time. And the thing is, you know, as they, they scroll through all the pictures of those who are now deceased and says, it's a blessing to be alive. How many people that we know from our history that are no longer with us? You know, you know your mom and dad and grandparents will go on, but those people that you were close to and had friendships with are no longer with us. So this life is important. And to live it to the fullest of our ability in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And sharing the gospel with people, because you don't know where everybody is. And... Uh, <clears throat> One of, the, one of the guys asked me if I would pray, and I said, for the, the meal. I said, well, sure. So I got up and prayed. And so later I went to the bathroom, and one of my classmates came in, and he says, you know how to pray, don't you? <laughs> and I, they said, well, yeah. And he says, I could tell. You, you know how to pray. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, I am a pastor. He said, that's it. That's <laughs> Because I didn't have notes, I didn't have, I just, just shoot it from the heart, so uh, it was good to see a lot of old friends and stuff, and surprising how we're all over the country and stuff. I graduated from Kennewick in 1972, and uh, so it's, uh, it's, been a, it's been a good journey, and, um, but I'm, a, I'm more excited about graduating to the kingdom of heaven. Uh, that's the major graduation. When we graduate from this life into eternity. <clears throat> so, um, I, have a, I have a question to ask. Those that uh, uh, probably I know that have been here for, for years, but I'm trying to get a sur- kind of a survey of... of um, those of us that are you're new to the church here, but you've been in church, how many are, have heard teachings on the fall feast? The fall feast. The feast of trumpets, tree feast of tabernacles, a few. See, that's, this was probably 20 years ago or so, is I was uh, just in my time of prayer and pursuing God, the Lord began to open up my heart and spirit to that we, you and I, are Jews. Whoa, I'm a Jew? We're Abraham's seed. So we're just as much a Jew as those in Israel. Because we have been grafted in to the vine, to the tree. So we are Jewish. But why is it we don't know our Jewish heritage? You know, when Shirley and I got married, she had a son. And so I adopted him. He is my son. And when we did the adoption, he says, you cannot disown him. I can disown my, two, my other two sons, but I can't disown him. It was more binding than my natural-born children. So we are grafted in, we are adopted in, God will not disown us. We are Jewish. But 
the church has robbed us, the church through the years has robbed us of our Jewish heritage and what it really means to be the sons and daughters of Abraham. That's our heritage. That's our spiritual heritage. And we walk in that spiritual heritage. We know the spring feasts. We know Passover, first fruits. We know the spring feasts because we observe Easter. I don't call it Easter anymore. Because that, it's after that name comes from the goddess of Esther, which is the goddess of fertility that is worshipped in the spring. That came into the church back during Constantine. He brought paganism into the church. They started worshipping the, the saints and the idols and all these things and stuff that entered into the church. No, it's Resurrection Sunday. Day that Jesus rose from the dead. So I do once in a while say Easter because people, you say resurrection and people don't have to make a connection to it until you say Easter. No, it's resurrection Sunday. And so it's like, as I begin to study this, I want to know my Jewish heritage. That's, that's who we are. We're Jews. Sons of Abraham. So we should know the feasts. I just did a teaching this spring on Pentecost. How important is that to the church? It was the birthday of the church. How come the church throughout the world isn't celebrating its birthday? That we were empowered by the Holy Spirit to be the witnesses into the world. To bring the transformation into the world. We cannot do it without the Holy Spirit. Amen. And walking in the Holy Spirit. How many of us really know what the fall feasts are? Well, that's Jewish things. Well, that's our thing. There's some very significant things that happen in the fall feast. And I've been teaching this in, for quite a while. And this was back, oh, probably 15 years or so. We were at a pastor's conference. And I was sitting down talking with this this pastor, and he was a Jewish man who was a pastor in a, a Messianic Jewish congregation. And so we were going through this, you know, I was talking to him about all this stuff that I'm just talking to you about, and he says, you are unusual. I said, what do you, what do you mean? He says, most pastors don't know this stuff. Because I was talking about the feast, I was talking about Pentecost, I was talking about all these different things you know, and it was, he, he really enjoyed the conversation we had with a pastor. Well, what a shame. What a shame that we don't know our, our heritage. So, we're going to talk about Rosh Hashanah. I mean, know what Rosh Hashanah is? Few. Feast of Trumpets. That starts next Sunday evening. The Feast of Trumpets. And we're going to go through the Feast of Trumpets is God's call to wake up! Amen. God says that they, these feasts are my appointments. In Leviticus 23.2 it says, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The Feast of the Lord... What does it say? The feast of the Lord. Not Jewish feast. The feast of the Lord, Most High, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feasts. Whose feasts are they? Are they Jewish feasts? They're God's feasts. His holy convocations. That he wants his people to come to him. In these specific times. Feasts mean appointments. These are appointments that God has set throughout history of time. These are appointed times that I want to meet with you. Do you think it's, there's a significance that happens in an appointment? When you go to a doctor, don't you set an appointment? 
When you go to your tax man, do you set an appointment? Something significantly happens at that time. So these appointments, God says, I am setting these appointments that will be throughout history. I want to meet with you. Convocations means dress rehearsals. It's a dress rehearsal for something that was coming. So what is a dress rehearsal for Passover? Moses instituted Passover, the sacrificial lamb that was slain upon the altar to take away the sins of Israel. And they did it every year on Passover. Do you think that was an important time? Who became our Passover lamb? Jesus. Jesus. Once and for all. So we don't have to sacrifice any more lambs because he did it once and for all. But we celebrate it, don't we? Resurrection Sunday. He rose from the dead. So it's important that these are holy times that we observe. Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, is is an appointment that we observe every year. It's the birthday of the church. It's the empowering of the Holy Spirit that comes into our lives. So it's just important that we celebrate the fall feast. The feast with God are appointments. I want specific times I want to meet with you. The first three were rehearsals for this first coming and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which was the fourth. The fourth was the the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The next three rehearsals are rehearsals for his second coming. So do you think it's important that the church should know these rehearsal times that we are preparing for him coming back? And why doesn't the church know about this? Well, those are Jewish things. We are being robbed. We have been robbed of our heritage. Because I'm no longer a Gentile, I'm a child of Abraham. You're a child of Abraham. I want to know my heritage. Because my adopted son, he's, he's, he's got the Keller, Keller name, he's got Keller heritage, he's got every right and privilege in our family because he is my son. And he's just as much of my son as my natural born children. He is my son. His kids are my kids, my grandkids. There's no distinction between them. The same way that God looks at us, we are his sons and daughters. We're just as much Jewish as those that live in Israel, probably more than some because some of them don't know the Messiah. They're lost. Yeah, they have Jewish heritage in the blood, but they don't have the relationship with Almighty God that only comes through Jesus Christ. A dress rehearsal is a preparation for things to come. Observance is not a matter of righteousness or salvation, but blessing. These are blessings. You don't do these to become righteous. You don't do these to become saved. It's, that's, that's taken care of on the cross with Jesus. It's a, it's a rehearsal, it's a blessing to come into these times. It's a blessing to observe Resurrection Sunday and to remember what Jesus has done. It's a, it's a blessing when we partake of the Lord's table. It's a blessing to remember those things and keep them fresh in our heart and spirit. John's Gospel, 660 times of the 879 verses are directly related to events occurring at feasts. The observance is not a matter of righteousness or salvation, but blessing. God's glory will be released because we will have such intimacy with him and will yield completely to the Holy Spirit. So that's what the Holy Spirit is working. It's drawing us in to a complete commitment. Well, I don't just go to church on Sundays. I observe church every day of the week. 
because the Lord is all, I'm just, I try to have a dialogue with, throughout the day with the Lord. Questions and thoughts and things that I'm running through my head, you know, what do you want me to speak on next Sunday, and, you know, or what's going on in this situation? I just, how many of you heard of the big storm that's going on up in Alaska? And uh, so I'm praying about that storm because my son is out right now out on an Aleutian chain, the furthest, furthest one out there. And uh, I was praying for him because it went right through the Aleutian chain. It's going up to the north. And uh, 90 some feet waves and stuff. He's out there on a rebuilding, a, I can't say, a, an installation out there. He'd be there till just before Christmas. But uh, so I was praying that this week. I've been praying for my son, keep him safe. And I messaged him yesterday. The only way we can communicate is messenger. So I messaged him. I said, uh, "Did that storm hit you? And and uh, is everything okay?" I pray. And he messaged me back with some pictures. And he said, "Yeah, it hit us head on, but we're all good." And he showed me pictures of of him out there so it's like there's things that are going on in our life all the time that i thank you lord that you're with me because you never know what's coming in your life and stuff that i thank you lord i don't have to wait to sunday to go to church and ask for prayer i like to do that but i can intercede and pray you know surely and i are praying and stuff you know it's like we, this it's important to have this relationship with the Holy Spirit that's with us all the time. Every moment of every day, He is with us, walking with us. Jesus is not returning for a fractured, powerless bride. Amen. Well, Father, i got to go down and get Him. They're just a mess down there. You know, they're just getting the snot kicked out of them. I better go get Him before I still got some. Is that what God's, the whole, Jesus is saying? Uh, scripture tells me he's coming back for not a powerless bride, but a, a bride that's full of power. Amen. Full of the anointing, full of the, the, the moving and the power of the Holy Spirit. The bride made herself ready. That means she's fully adorned with the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit that's flowing in her life, uh, our life. And that every moment, every day, we are functioning in the glory of the Holy Spirit. I wish we could sometimes see into the spiritual realm and see the glory that's around each one of us. Demons see it. They see that glory that's on you. We can't because we're in the natural, but they can. Sometimes I wish, Lord, open our eyes, let us see. Let us see the glory that's on us. So the Feast of Trumpets, the first of the false feasts. On the first day of the seventh month, you are to have a day of rest. A sacred assembly commemorated with the trumpet blast. The tenth day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. When atonement is made for you before the Lord your God, on the 15th day of the seventh month, the Lord's Feast of Tabernacles. This is listing all the feasts. Trumpets, days of atonement, and tabernacles. So, <clears throat> I got a calendar wheel I've just found. It's, I wish I had a, a pointer, but I don't. This is... You see over here on the left side, where it says January, December, January, that's our, the Gregorian calendar. Okay, up there, Nisan, Nisan is the first month of the Jewish calendar. What happens the first month of the Jewish calendar? Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. Jesus fulfilled those. Then we come down to Sivan, the third month, Pentecost. Pentecost was fulfilled. Then we come down to to Tishri, and in Tishri we have trumpets, days of atonement, and tabernacles. And then they put in Hanukkah up there. That's that's something else. (laughs) We're looking at these these seven feasts here. That's that's what we're focusing on. We've completed the the top top four. Now we're down here on these. 
So it's, they haven't been fulfilled yet, so do you think it's important for us to recognize them? As the sons and daughters of Abraham, Jewish people, we should be observing those. Not out of legalism, but out of the presence of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. In God's calendar, there are three appointed times. The year begins with the Passover, Feast of First Fruits, Unleavened Bread, which initiates the godly cycle. In the third month, we have Pentecost. Then comes the long, hot summer. Then we celebrate his glory at the Feast of Tabernacles. The seventh month, the Feast of, Tabernac- uh, Feast of Trumpets. There in Jewish tradition, the feast, oh, go back, go back to the, the picture. The, uh, the Feast of Trumpets, right here, was originally considered the birth of the world when God created the heavens and the earth and created the world. That was the birthday of the world. And what happened is that sin entered into the world. Sin entered into the world, and so we needed to get back on track. So God instituted a new year, a new new year, Nisan 1. That began the new calendar for redemption. That's when redemption took into effect to bring us back into right relationship with the Father that we lost through sin. Okay? Now, the fall feasts right here are the new, new calendar. Because the fall feast, the Feast of Trumpets, let me, I'm, I'm totally off on my track of my... The blasting of the trumpet at Rosh Hashanah is the signaling to shift out of the old cycle and into the new with the presence of God. Okay, sin brought us into a new calendar, a redemptive calendar that we've been in. And because of Jesus coming down on the cross, brought the redemptive calendar. But the celebration of the fall feasts are the celebration of his second coming. He's coming back for us. Let me see. I am totally out of sync here. I'm looking for a specific scripture. I know it's here. I'm one of those old guys at the Oh, here it is. First Thessalonians four, fifteen through sixteen. Yeah, I'm totally out of sync of what, what's up there right now. First Thessalonians states For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. So those who have gone on are already there, but we who are alive in the earth right now. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangels and the trump of God. The trump of God is signifying something is major happening on the earth. 
So what's the first thing we celebrate? Feast of Trumpets. Feast of Trumpets. Many believe, I believe, it it's has to do with that last trump. That trump that calls us all together again. Brings us back in. And we come, next week I'll, I'll get into what the Day of Atonement is and what Tabernacles is. Day of Atonement, quickly, is just, it's a self-introspection. Ten days you go through of self-introspecting. The, you know, in my Right with the Lord is my heart right? Is my spirit right? Is you know? Is there any wicked way in me? David prayed. You know, I want to be on track with you. So it's a ten days of of personal evaluation. At the end of that, we enter in Shakot Tabernacles, where the, the the Jewish tradition is is they would set out in their yard tents, temporary dwelling places. They were in tents. This place is our temporary dwelling place. But it's coming a time that we're going to hear the trumpet blast and we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and we go to our new home that he has been building for us. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And where I go, I will come back and get you and bring you to myself. That was Jesus' words. So it's kind of, kind of interesting that those happen at the, at, back at the original beginning of creation. That used to be the first days of the year, right here. And we're coming back, we're going to come back to that. So we don't know the day or the hour. Well, when that happens, when they blow the trumpet, the priests don't know the day or the hour because it depends upon the moon. It depends how it comes up. They don't know which day it is. It doesn't say we won't know the month or we won't know the year. We won't know the season. It says we won't know the day or the hour. So that's kind of interesting. You think about it. Could it be that everything begins on that? I don't know. This year, next year, we don't, we don't know. But it's interesting when you start digging into these things, you find there are some significant things that are happening along the line here. So, the trumpet blast at Rosh Hashanah is the signaling of a shifting out of an old cycle into a new cycle. What, oh, it's the old cycle we're in now the world we're living in now. Could it be the shifting of, into the new cycle, into eternity? God does everything by patterns. Everything. He's not random. There's always specific things that God does over and over again. He, he follows a pattern. So it's like we need to get into kind of sync with these patterns. We don't know exactly. Scripture says we don't know the day or the hour. But we should be able to find out the season. Paul, he raises fruit out there, and he kind of knows the season it's time to pick because he watches what's going on out in the orchard and the trees and how the fruit is developing and stuff. And they know, okay, this is the time for the harvest. The shift, it's interesting, this could be the shift back to the original head of the year. The seventh month of redemption becomes the first month of the new year of blessing. The countdown to his presence. The fall feasts were given to create a pathway to God's glory. The four steps into his presence. Now we can go to that, the countdown slide there. Next one. Next one. There we go. We're sorry right there. The first one is the Feast of Trumpets, which is the wake-up call. Wake up! As we blow the trumpets. We blow the trumpet, the wake us up, it's time to come into service. There's different reasons that they blow, blew the trumpets. But here, this trumpet blast. And so in the Thessalonians, we read 
there will be a blast in the heavens that the whole world will hear. I'm coming. The Feast of Trumpets, the wake-up call. Next, the day of awe, the time of seeking self, the introspection. We're looking every year. We're spending time in the Lord, and we'll be talking more about this later. The day of atonement, the day to be restored to full fellowship. Full fellowship. Yes, we have full fellowship here that's in this world, but we will have full fellowship when we put on immortality. When we are completed, we will have the ultimate relationship with the Lord. Amen. So these are things of looking forward to. These feasts, we're look, they haven't been fulfilled yet. So we're looking forward. This is coming in the future. So the Day of Atonement, the restoration of full fellowship, and then the Feast of Tabernacle, a week of experiencing His glory, where they would, like I said, they would dwell in a tent experiencing going into that presence that we dwell with the Lord forever in eternity. The feasts have always been important, but tabernacles is a key feast for the church today. We live in a day when God wants to draw us into his presence in a unique, unique way. It is a time for his power, blessing to be poured out and he wants us to experience his glory. He wants us to experience his glory. God has one commandment about the feast, that all people should listen for the trumpet blast. We should be living our lives listening for that trumpet blast. The blast of the trumpet is a call to awake, the Hebrew word for the feast is Yom Turon, which means the day of the wakening blast. The wakening blast is that one where the archangel blows a trumpet and the whole world's going to hear that wakening blast. A wake up call almost always comes before revival. This is true for nations and also individuals. There's always something that happens in your life, in your city, in a group. Something will happen that will trigger a move. It could be a crisis in your life. It could be a situation that happens in your life that causes, that, that shakes you up, that wakes you up. Do you begin to reevaluate where you are, what you're doing? I can't keep going down this road anymore. I've got to change. Yeah. And all of a sudden, revival, which is a reversal, which is changing from this course to this course. Amen. People that have <clears throat> alcoholic problem, it could be a car wreck, it could be a near-death near experience, or something happens in their life that, oh, I can't continue to drink like this anymore. i got to get rid of it. And I can't go halfway. I've got to get rid of it all. See, there's always something in our lives. And so it's... How do I say this? Sometimes we want to protect people. But sometimes that protection is the one thing that's going to cause them to linger in their situation. We have to come to a point where we face our consequence. We come face to face with it. And like I've said, as raising kids, mom will say, oh, sweetie, you know, and, and she'll take care of you. And dad says, I bet you won't do that again. <laughs> There's a different attitude there. A lot of times we want to go in and we want to comfort people and we make it all better and stuff. But it's, there's one thing to comfort, but it's not to eliminate the facing the consequence of their action. Amen. And God, I believe, is allowing our nation as a whole to come to see the consequence of our action of turning away from God. Amen. A nation that is turned away from God. And what happens is Scripture tells us that, you, that a person who is possessed and you clean the house 
but you don't fill it, it says they will, those demons will go out there and they'll come back and say, this is clean. I'll bring seven of my friends. So what happens is the revivals that we've had in the past, the awakenings we've had, we cleaned the house, but we didn't fill it with the Holy Spirit and with the move and the power of God. And so what happens, we have slowly through the, the years have stripped out Christianity that we are the evil people. No more prayer in school. No more uh, uh, God in anything. You can't say God out in the public almost. Jesus, you're, you're a hate, you're, you're an evil person if you use the name of Jesus out in the public. No, as a prayer or something like that, not a curse. It's okay if you curse. But what has happened to our culture, we, the revivals and awakenings stripped out the evil, the evil left, and they've come back and found this place is clean. And they're coming back seven times worse. So that means that we have a job to do. The body of Christ has to rise in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. This is a wake-up hour for the church. We've got to wake up, we've got to engage the battle, and we've got to save souls. We may not save the nation, but we've got to save people. We've got to save people. And pray, pray that our, our city will get saved, our, our, our Olympia will get saved. We're praying for that Wednesday night. The Lord, cast out those demons. In Olympia. Yeah. Amen. Clean house over there, Lord. But this is a time we got to wake up. we got to wake up and engage the battle. God doesn't want us to wait until disaster strikes to engage his presence. The Feast of Trumpets is designed to be a time when the sound of the trumpet wakes us up. So if we are <clears throat> been walking with an understanding of this, every year should be a time for the body of Christ to hear the trumpet and to do some 10 days of introspection, the days of awe, Lord, is there any wicked way? How, how can I move forward in my spiritual walk? How can I come closer to you? How can I reach my family? How 10 days that's coming up. We'll talk more about that next week. When we hear the trumpet blast, ask God to reveal if you are not where you need to be. Are you doing what God wants you to be doing? Are you engaged where God wants you to be engaged? Are you off doing your thing? That's between you and God. It's a, it's a preparation. I read th- uh, 1 Thessalonians. Really, I'm going to read again. For this we say to, <clears throat> to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain... So this sounds like it's kind of like we're the ones that remain. Doesn't it sound like it's kind of like you're the ones still there until the coming of the Lord. So at some point, some of us are going to be those who remain when the Lord comes back. So that means if 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 he's coming shortly, then that's referring to us will by no means precede those who are asleep or have gone on to be with the Lord. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and will ever be with the Lord. <clears throat> we are living in a time of preparation for eternity. We are preparing for eternity. Even though we may be moving towards a a secular career, we may be looking at going to college, we may be graduating school, even though we're living our life, we don't know when this time is coming, but we live our life every day as preparing for eternity. Well, I'll wait 20 years from now. Well, 20 years from now may not be here. I live my life today in preparation for eternity tomorrow. I don't know when the time is coming. 
the signs are stacking up here. And that's what I'm going to share with us, some signs that are, that are stacked up here. It looks like it could be some, real close. I'm not saying the Feast of Trumpets next Monday, Sunday night, the trump, that trumpet's going to blast. It, it could. I don't know. It could be next year. Or it could be the preparation of the trumpet blast that's coming this next year, because I'll, I'll show you, share with you some three some things here. There are three interesting facts happening this year connecting with the fall feast. Number one, we are ending a Shemitah week. A week in scripture is five, uh, seven. Okay, seven years is a week of years. Seven days is a week of days. Creation, all of creation from uh, birth of Adam till it's over is a week of a, a century, 7,000 years. Everything is in the weeks of seven. So tabernacles, normally the men <coughs> this year, uh, tabernacles, normally the men were required to attend. Most, all, all, uh, every, every year, six, six of the seven years, men were only required to go to Jerusalem. The wives would, could go if they want to. They weren't mandated to go. The men were mandated to go. But on the seventh year, all, only the king could make this decree, and he would, by his authority, he would mandate men, women, Children, strangers, had to go to Jerusalem and they were required to attend the feast. This is the end of the seventh year of this Shemitah week that we're in. So this, this Shemitah coming up that we're going to be celebrating starting next Sunday evening was a mandate that from the king, and only the king could make this, Moses he wasn't officially king, but he was ahead. He instituted it, and the king could make this declaration. So there's something significant about this one. It's the seventh one. It's also the beginning of a new Shemitah cycle. There's things that happen with a new Shemitah cycle that we're starting a brand new cycle. It is also, uh, it is the beginning of a jubilee year. Every 49, uh, every 49 years, every seven Shemitah cycles, so you have seven, so the 49th one is this one. Next year, that starting this fall through next year, is a jubilee, the 50th year. Israel was sent into captivity for not observing the Shemitah weeks. So they were in Babylon for it was for uh, because they missed seven. So uh, seven times seventy is four hundred and ninety years. So uh, and the Shemitah this year. The Shemitah week that we're in this, this year, because it's the seventh one, the land has to rest. No one works. Uh, everything, every, the land, and all the people rest for one year. Because they did not do that, Israel, for 70 cycles, which is a total of 490 years, they were sent into Babylonian captivity and Israel land rested. All but the seventh week, which is Daniel's seventh week. I hope this isn't out of your head. I'll, I can explain more of it later. <laughs> but this, this, this Daniel, the Daniel's prophecy of the seventh week has not been fulfilled yet. 
there's many scholars out there that believe that we could be starting Daniel's 70th week, which starts next week, which starts for seven years. Uh, the land will rest for a year. They serve all they served all but the last seven years, Daniel's 70th week. It must begin the first week of a Shemitah cycle. The fall is the beginning of a new Shemitah cycle that we're in right, coming into right now. This year, all three are happening at the same time, right now. The, it, the end of the Shemitah week, the land has to rest for this year. And also the Jubilee has to rest. The whole nation has to rest for seven years. Which is kind of unique that it doesn't happen because the next time this will happen won't be for another 50 years. And also, if this doesn't anything happen here, the next Smita, end of Smita will be in 2029. So what it's saying is there's things that are stacking up biblically right now. So what this tells us that, that we're living in a time, whether we know the details, all this, we, I want us to know that we're living in a critical time biblically. Amen. That this year is a year of rest biblically. So at some time... I. Could be next week, next tomorrow, or it could be next month, it could be next year. Sometime the Lord is coming back, and that trumpet blast is going to happen. So that means that we need to be engaged. That's what it boils down to: is we need to be engaged because we're living in a critical time. Because there's souls out there that need what we have. It's like watching the fruit tree. The, ripe, the fruit is getting ripe. Now here's just for information, as we're entering a jubilee year, this whole year, this is what jubilee means. Jubilee literally means ram horn. So when we, we blow a ram's horn, the trumpet. In Hebrew, it defined, it's defined in Leviticus 25.9. So if you want to go to 25... As the Shemitah year, after seven cycles of seven, 49 years, the 50th year was to be a time of celebration, rejoicing for Israel. The ram's horn was blown on the 10th day of the seventh month to start the 50th year of universal redemption. The year of Jubilee involves a year of releasing from indebtedness. Leviticus 25. And all types of bondage. This is interesting because it's, it's total freedom here. All prisoners and captives were set free. All slaves were released. All debt was forgiven. All property was returned to the original owner. Whose property is this? Maybe it's going back to the original owner. Just saying. In addition, all labor was to cease for one year, and those bound by labor contracts were released from them. One of the benefits of the Jubilee was that both the land and the people were able to rest. The Jubilee presents a beautiful picture of the New Testament theme of redemption and forgiveness. Christ is the Redeemer who set come to set us free from those who are slaves and prisoners to sin. The debt of sin we owe to God was paid at the cross of Jesus Christ on our behalf. And we are forgiven the debt forever. We are no longer in bondage, no longer slaves to sin. Having been freed by Christ... We can truly enter into his rest. God provided as we cease laboring 
to make ourselves acceptable to God and not by works. Freedom! It's a celebration of freedom. Freedom from the bondages of this world, from the troubles of this world. No, I don't mean quit your job tomorrow. That's not what I'm saying. But this is, this is spiritually what is taking place. And so we are engaging in a time that's very critical. And we shouldn't just, just well, that's just one of those Bible things and we go on. It's a time that we do some introspection. We, we say, Lord, what, what does this mean to me? What does this mean for my family? How can we press in? How does it mean for us as a church and stuff? Because we want to come in sync with what you're doing, Lord. Because tabernacles, the celebration, and the completion of our earthly journey. We're coming into the completion of our earthly journey. Now, like I, I've said before, that's, that's a, there's a, one more slide up there. What I've said before is we not, should not be a body of believers that want to escape. Amen. Right. It's not about escapism. No. It's not about, oh, Lord, catch us out of here. It's, it's coming. I'm, all I'm saying, uh, the ens- es- essence is he's coming, whether it's now, whenever. Our mission should be about getting souls. Yes. And once we're out of here, this will be very difficult. There will be those that will get saved, that will accept the Lord after we're out, but it will be very difficult because the Holy Spirit has been removed from the earth. The, the Holy Spirit is the restrainer of evil. Where does he dwell? In us. Now, does that mean that there was... And that... <clears throat> Those that get saved afterwards will be like those that are walking with the Lord who were pre-Jesus. That came to, to Jesus, that came to the Lord and followed the Lord faithfully before. But we are the body of Christ. Because we're living in this hour. Once the rapture or the catching away, Thessalonians talked about caught up to meet the Lord in the air. The bride of Christ is now out of here. The bride of Christ will not be in the earth. She will be there in heaven. And we will come back with him to rule and reign on the earth. So it's, it's, it's a very critical time for us to be in prayer and intercession. Because I think most of us in here, are, we're saved, we're going to heaven. But our mission is to reach those out there to pray for those out there, to let our light shine for those out there. Pray for our family members that don't know you. That's our mission. Yes. And like I've said, it's my greatest privilege is the day I can stand before the Lord and I can receive the martyr's crown. Personally, it would be great to go up, but personally, I would rather go out as a martyr because Jesus laid his life down for me. I'm going to lay my life down for him and be willing to pay the price, whatever it takes. So Lord, hold it back. Don't come yet. Help us get more. How many of us have family members, relatives that don't know you yet, Lord? So we, need, we have a mission right here. Just those of us here, but besides those out there that we work with and that we play with and we go to school with and activities out there in the community. So it's the fig tree is looking like it's getting close to being ripe. So that means we have to be on mission. Amen? Amen? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I, I hope this didn't it's a lot of a lot of inform- I tried to shrink it down, and uh, to help us. Yes. I was at Clay Clark's three wedding tour this weekend. If anybody knows. Who? Clay Clark and Gerald Flynn. Yep. Yeah, they post balls this weekend. Yeah. Okay. Were you guys there? I was there. Okay. Yeah, 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 you so you can confirm. I was. It was intense. It was awesome. It was amazing. And it reads what pastor. Exactly. Well, your mind is blown with all this stuff. But anyway, when we talk about what he's talking about, is a confirmation to me. It should be a confirmation to everybody here. There was preachers that were teaching the same stuff.
Amen. Thank you. Amen. Hallelujah. I think we need to worship the Lord.